Hi everybody. Today I would like to have a look at Abraham, how God viewed him and in how far we can apply that to our lives. Let's have a look at Hebrews 11. The first thing we read about him is the following. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. The first thing it says is that he obeyed when he was called by God. Is this true? Well, yes, he did. But not without delay, not right away. Rather, he did it quite reluctantly. And yet, this is God's summary of his faith walk. With us, it's the same. All that remains after the Bema judgment will be the gold, silver, and precious stones. God will remember the wood, hay, and stubble no more. But what I want to focus on is the fact that it says that when he eventually did go, he didn't know where he was going. God had called him out of Ur into a land he was to show him while he was on the journey. Now, later in the chapter we see that Abraham knew that his final eternal destiny was the city whose architect and builder is God. This here was about his journey with God on this earth, his ministry, so to speak. So he didn't know where he was going. In contrast to him, many of us, when we become believers, are convinced we know exactly what God wants from us and what his calling is. I thought I did. I became a believer around my 15th birthday. Shortly after that, the thing was clear to me. The field was ripe, ripe for harvest and the workers were few. I was convinced that God had called me to the mission field. I wanted to go to a tribe that hadn't heard the gospel before and didn't have a Bible in their language and translate the Bible for them. I had read books like Peace Child, Ruchko and Shadow of the Almighty. I figured that that was the most important task at hand because Jesus could only come back when everyone had heard the gospel. I also love languages and have a gifting in this area, so this fit in there as well. I did several trips of different duration to South and Central America, to Guatemala, Peru and Mexico. Now, for you guys in the States, it is not that far, but for me, it was a long distance flight each time and quite an expense as well. I also spent a year in the US as a guest student at a Christian college where I took, among other classes, elementary New Testament Greek because I figured I would be needing this in order to translate the Bible, respectively the New Testament. To make a long story short, when I was 27, I got back from Mexico, still single, broke, and spiritually speaking, a wreck, due to legalism and spiritual abuse I had experienced along the way. I was done. I couldn't even read the Bible anymore. At that point, I didn't ponder about the fact that I wouldn't be going to the mission field anymore, but in the years and decades to come, every time I thought about this, I could make sense of it and came to the conclusion that I had failed in my Christian walk and missed my calling. Others might have made it, but not me. Jim Elliot, for example, worked towards his goal to become a missionary in Ecuador without any detour. By the time he was 28, he had attempted to evangelize a tribe in the jungle and had already died as a martyr. When Jesus had his one-on-one -on -one conversation with Peter and had also revealed to him that he would die as a martyr, Peter pointed to John and said, But Lord, what about this man? But Jesus said, If I will that he remain till I come, what's that to you? You follow me. So it doesn't matter what others seem to have achieved for the Lord. This is about him and you. Let's have a brief look at Moses. In his zeal to help the Israelites, 
he killed an Egyptian. After that, he fled and lived in Midian. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, while he had left Pharaoh's household, all that happened was that he got married and tended the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. He had given up all efforts to help the Israelites. That was it for him. But back to Abraham and the second description of his faith. By faith, he dwelled in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He knew where his eternal destiny was, the heavenly city. But let's read that again. This is the chapter about all those who are attested to faith by God, for us as an example. What exactly is Abraham's glorious act of faith here? By, fa by faith he dwelled in tents, waiting. We Germans have a reputation of being very efficient at work. As you know, Germany was divided after World War II into the democratic free western half, the Federal Republic, and the socialist eastern half, the GDR. Shortly after the turnaround in 1990, I was working in an office at that time, we had this new employee who had come over from the east. At one time, it was late morning, 11 a.m. or so, she came over to my desk with a stressed out look on her face. I said, are you okay? She goes, no, I'm completely exhausted. I asked her what was the matter and she said, well, back at home, she was talking about when she lived in the GDR. At this point, I would have gone out to do some shopping or something for an hour or two. We just don't work through from morning to evening. I cannot concentrate that long. I looked at her pretty bewildered, because when you work, you work, right? We don't get paid for going shopping. But here you have the difference between socialist planned economy and social market economy. They have full employment, but that does not mean that their work actually contributes to the GDP. On another occasion, I was working at a Japanese company. Now. The Japanese culture is very different from our Western culture in that it is a collectivistic culture as opposed to our individualistic one. Say you're Japanese and your work is done by 6 p.m. but your boss decides to play computer games until 10 p.m. then you simply don't go home yet. You have to stay until he decides to go. Contrary to these behaviors, we are used to be efficient and work towards results. I remember listening to a sermon on rewards many years ago. The preacher gave examples of what he figured was lasting building material according to 1 Corinthians 3 and what wasn't. I still remember today how he listed things like mowing the lawn and all kinds of everyday activities that were necessary and said, well, all those things are going to burn up. Only that which we have done for the Lord will remain and will be rewarded. By that he meant activities like evangelizing, giving, etc. I remember the depressed feeling I had after listening to that sermon. In my head, all those everyday activities came to mind and how most of what I did would fall under the category of being useless. That made me pretty depressed. Now look at Abraham. What is said about him is that he dwelt in tents, waiting. Waiting doesn't sound like a terribly efficient activity at all, does it? It does not say, everywhere he pitched up his tent, he had a tent crusade, he built an orphanage or founded a Bible school. No. Living in tents just showed that he waited for the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I have to think of a waiting room. That is a transitory room. You do sit down all right, but you don't make your home there. You don't even concentrate on much in there. 
you might pick up one of the magazines that are on the table and have a quick glance through it, but you're always on the alert because you know that your name can be called any time. You'll be let out of the room to the person you have the appointment with and into the room where it is taking place. So you might be somebody whose waiting is unnoticed by those around you. Outwardly, you cannot be distinguished from those in your neighborhood. You live a normal life. Your goal is simply not that of achieving something in this world. But God knows you and sees that the attitude of your heart is that of someone who's aware he's only in the waiting room here. The Holy Spirit included this characteristic of Abraham in the collection of characteristics that exhibit faith. So different from what we might have considered worth mentioning. So be encouraged. God sees your inner attitude and longing that nobody else can see. Let's go back to Moses again. After having killed the Egyptian, he lived in Midian until decades later, God called him to go to Pharaoh and demand on his behalf that his people be let go. All those years in Midian were a period of waiting for him, for God to be able to work on him so that eventually he would not rely on his own strength anymore. To a point where he even flat out refused to do it. The thing is though, that Moses himself wasn't even aware of the fact that it was a time period of waiting for him. He thought this was it. The project of liberating the Israelites was over. An attempt way back in the past, vaguely remembered. Let's go on. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Let's look at that again. It says, offered up Isaac. Now, you might say, well, yes, he did, didn't he? I mean, almost, right? He had already laid him on the altar and lifted up his arm with a knife. That's correct, almost. However, if you look anywhere else in the Bible, offering up a sacrifice means exactly that, to have offered it up completely, that is, to have actually killed it. Here, however, God treats Abraham's intention in the same way as if it had actually happened. Now, I'm not saying here that God treats my intentions to evangelize a jungle tribe in the same way as if it had all, uh, actually happened. What I'm saying is that he thinks way beyond what you see and count as result. This applies especially to the times we're living in. The rapture is about to happen. Maybe you have a family member, relative or friend you know are saved, but currently, like the prodigal son, are on their way away from the father's house. You trust the Lord and you know that just like in the parable, there will come a time when they bought him out come to their senses and will return to the father's house. After all, the shepherd himself cares for his own and goes after the one lost sheep. But we are a special generation and very soon, any time, the rapture is about to happen and will bring an end to our earthly existence and to that of all living believers. So they will most likely not have this chance anymore to go through this whole process which can take years or decades. Is God unfair, since others and former generations had the chance to still be fruitful after they had returned to build with gold, silver and precious stones, and this generation won't have this opportunity? God is not bound by time. He knows everything. His judgment is just. He knows we are the rapture generation and he is well able beyond our limited human thinking to take all things into consideration. He will decide lovingly and just. Just leave it up to him to decide what he's going to regard as if it had indeed happened. Or maybe you find yourself in the story of Moses. Maybe you say, yes, like him, I had initial zeal and killed my Egyptian. Now I have been living in Midian for years or decades already, 
but so far God's call for ministry hasn't reached me yet, and who knows if it still will until the rapture. Have I missed my calling now? Missed the opportunity to bear fruit for him because of the rapture? Don't worry, God knows all things. He saw Abraham as somebody who had obeyed, period, and who had sacrificed Isaac. He is the originator of the rapture. He knows about this unique generation and takes all things into consideration. Now, these are just thoughts of mine. I'm not dogmatic about this, but I do see a pattern here with Abraham. And I am convinced God is so much greater than we can even fathom. So, be encouraged. God knows those who are his, and he is not limited by time.